I'm going to be continuing some phone line simulator projects I started a few years ago, and this time I'm going to work on getting the phones and modems to ring. The first thing I need to work on is cleaning up the mess of temporary cabling I was using with old wall mount jacks and alligator clips to connect them. It would be easier to have a smaller phone jack I can directly plug into a breadboard, and PCBWay sponsored a breakout board project that can do this. This is the phone jack breakout board schematic. Moving on, the RJ connectors used for phone lines are called registered jacks, and the specific part number for a connector of the same size can vary based on how many conductor positions there are available and how many conductors are actually populated in the connector. The most common for phones is RJ11, which has six positions and two conductors for a single phone line tip and ring. The RJ jack I'm using is a six position six conductor from AliExpress, but as long as the dimensions are all the same, a different connector with only four or two positions can be populated. A simplified diagram of a telephone central office shows that a DC voltage of minus 48 volts is presented to the phone line tip and ring, and there's an option to superimpose an AC ring voltage when needed to make the phones ring. When the phone is picked up and taken off hook to make a call, it presents a load of several hundred ohms across the phone line, completing the circuit and establishing a loop current of up to several tens of milliamps. The voltage across tip and ring, which started around minus 48 volts, will drop to somewhere between around 4 and possibly up to over 10 volts, depending on the circuit. In order to simulate a telephone central office on the workbench and allow multiple phones or modems to operate on it, the first thing to do is provide the DC voltage across tip and ring on these jacks. It doesn't have to be as high as 48 volts. It just has to be enough to allow the phones to receive enough current to function. This is the final setup I ended up with, including the ring voltage, but for now, just looking at the DC voltage, I ended up using between 13 and 14 volts. I put two 200 ohm resistors in series with the DC supply to provide current limiting as well as to represent the normal impedances present in the phone line loop circuit which helps to establish the expected loop current when a phone goes off hook and completes the circuit. If I assume I won't use more than 50 milliamps of loop current, then these resistors may need to be rated to handle up to a half watt each, 50 milliamps squared times 200 ohms. With the circuit assembled, I'm going to take a phone off hook and press the buttons until I can hear the DTMF tones working. When the touch tones were audible, the off-hook voltage was 6 volts, and the loop current was 18.5 milliamps. And after hanging up the phone, the on-hook voltage that I ended up with to start with was 14 volts, instead of 48. Later, I ended up changing it closer to 13 volts as I kept working on this system. Next, I added a second phone jack to the system and plugged in another phone. With both phones off-hook, I was able to press buttons on one phone and hear them coming through on the other. The voltage dropped to 4.7 volts, and the loop current went over 21 milliamps. Now to make the phones ring when on hook, an AC ring voltage needs to be applied to the phone line. There's a wide variety of voltages and frequencies that can work, but nominally it's an AC voltage around 90 volts at a frequency of 20 hertz. I don't need to be precise with the frequency. I've seen it stated as possibly being acceptable beyond 60 Hz, so I'm going to use 60 Hz since I can easily get that from the household line voltage using a transformer to step it down, and for safety reasons I'd like to use the lowest AC voltage I can get away with. I have a bunch of small transformers taken out of clocks or radios and things like that over the years, so since the secondary winding provides a floating AC voltage, I can connect some of these in series, increasing the overall AC voltage until I get the phones ringing. The transformer ring voltage was coupled to the phone line using a series non-polarized capacitor. I used a voltage rating of 250 volts to be able to handle any high voltages like the ring voltage, 
And this experiment worked best when I used a total of 1.56 microfarads. And it may or may not work even better if I had higher capacitance. But all I had on hand were a 1 micro and a 560 nano, which I pulled out of old phones, probably in the 90s. So I put those in parallel. This schematic shows a ring voltage of 18 volts RMS which is what I used later with the modems, but the phones wouldn't respond with this voltage, so I kept increasing until they finally rang. The ring voltage combined with the on-hook DC voltage I was using showed on the scope as 49 volts RMS and 80 volts peak, being a slightly irregular version of the AC sine wave. Since I intend to use this project for modems, the ring detect circuit in modems can respond to a much lower ring voltage, and a typical ring detect circuit may be an optocoupler and some Zener diodes, maybe between 10 or 20 volts or so. And by combining a few transformer windings, I ended up with 18 volts RMS, and I was able to see the LED responding on the modem, and the modem sent a ring notification to the computer. With this setup, the scope showed that the combined on-hook DC voltage and the ring voltage came out to 30 volts RMS and 46 volts peak with the irregular sine wave. Now that I have a functioning telephone line, I can continue developing it into a more complete system capable of generating and detecting DTMF tones so I can interpret dialed numbers, generate call progress tones, and work on handling the interaction between two sides of a phone connection. Thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this project, and thanks for watching.